Ain't Slayed Nobody is a produced actual play podcast intended for adults and may contain material that some people find disturbing. Please see the episode notes for content warnings and listen with care. When we left the posse, the head of community, Grace, had welcomed you to Olvido, and after she indicated that Colin Brock was the leader and she called him father, I believe Ellie was getting off of the horse for a possible confrontation. Ma'am? Grace, was it? Will you ask them to stop the music? Okay, Grace turns to face the band, and... Almost like the music teacher in Whiplash gives a quick zip it signal, and the <laughs> band stops unimpressively with some lingering squeaks. I actually do appreciate that very much. Thank you. Some of the people in the audience continue clapping. Are we able to observe how these people look? Do they look like they're have their wits about them, or yeah, like what's in their eyes? It's a mix. There are some people in this crowd that seem disengaged. They're not making eye contact, staring at the ground, sometimes clapping, sometimes not. Others are much more animated. They're grinning at you. They seem to be hanging on to every word of this conversation you're having with Grace. I just feel the need to say it again that something does not smell right. I'm not going to draw my gun, but I will pull back my coat in an obvious way and start tapping on the grip while I glare at this woman. I'll assume Ellie's wearing that coat on top of her white coveralls, and that she's also wearing her gun belt. Grace looks down and notices you tapping on the gun, Ellie. Then she steps closer and smiles. You will not need your weapons here, my friends. We are peaceful people and consider you part of our family. Get to know your brothers and sisters. Why don't you tell us more about Father Brock? Ma'am, do you know where we could find the father if we wanted to speak with him? Father Brock is eager to speak with you, but unfortunately he's left to fulfill duties of the church. Mm Mm-hmm. Sacrifices, I understand. (laughs) How long has Brock been here in Olvido? Two years, to the best of my knowledge. While he's out, we invite you to enjoy today's festivities and the fruits of our town. We've prepared the best rooms for you at the hotel. Now Grace looks up toward you, Johnny, but really she's looking at Birdie, and she extends her hands toward you. You are overburdened. We will care for your baby. No, I don't think you will. We're still getting to know each other. I understand. Grace does back off a bit, Ellie, after that response, and she motions to someone else. Maybe it's the man who runs the corral. Ah, beautiful animal here. I'll take him over to the hotel and come back for the others. And he points over to a hitching post along the outer wall of the hotel. It's about six feet long and seems to be in a fairly central location for the town. So that's the last time I'm going to see Sinead, is that what you're saying? (laughs) No, I'm not saying that. You were awful specific about where we were tying those horses. I'm I'm looking at a map of the town, that's all. I would like to give Sinead the longest hug. (laughs) (laughs) Goodbye, baby. You've been more than a horse to me. You've been a lover. (laughs) Nothing compares to you. Mm, Let's keep the baby, let's keep the weapons. You can take the 
the horses. Everyone can decide for themselves, but you can take you can take Jehovah. And once this animal handling is well underway, Grace looks back to you, Ellie. You do notice something odd. There's a woman in the crowd, and she catches your eye because you see her fall to her knees sobbing. She seems to be one of the townsfolk. She's dressed plainly, wearing her hair pulled back. And just then a man rushes in. It looks like he's trying to comfort her. Do you need any help? The woman waves you off, Ellie, and she begins to pull herself back onto her feet. Okay, I'm going to ask Grace, what's going on with her? She will be fine. We are overcome with joy upon seeing you. I'm sure that's it. Okay then, fun town. Then a tall man in a bowler hat steps out of the crowd, and he tips his hat toward the party. He's wearing a white shirt and a black tie beneath a dark brown waistcoat. There's a gold chain running into a pocket beneath his shiny sheriff's star, and his long tan duster matches his trousers, which are fitting over polished black boots. Howdy, friends. I'm Sheriff Hester. Welcome to Oviedo. I'm glad to finally meet you. Howdy, Sheriff. We we apologize. Were you also at the uh, the service? Uh, which service is that, friend? Whatever it is that y'all were doing with all the music and the hooting and hollering. Oh, this isn't a service. This is simply our welcoming committee. Mm. Sure. Our regular services are in the church on Tuesday evenings. And he points to the church on the hill. You can make it out better now that you're closer, and you see an adobe church with its entrance of two wooden doors facing the town. Uh, The front of the church has two towers that are crowned with crosses. I'll show my badge and ask him, how'd you come to be sheriff of this town? Well, I was elected by town residents with support from the father, of course. As he says this, he sweeps his hand, gesturing to the still celebrating crowd. They're just clapping. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's like a hoot nanny without <laughs> the upbeat music. So as the sheriff is drawing your attention to the crowd, Jay, will you give me a spot hidden roll for Lance? Let's see what he notices. Uh, I rolled a 62. Okay, I don't think that's going to pass for Lance. Mm, I doubt it. Well, Lance just recently came out of a little coma, and he's probably still feeling the effects. And he's also been very quickly introduced to Birdie and brought into this strange town. Were they called Colin Brock father? They do, that's right. And that would seem strange to you, Lance, who knows Brock as a ruthless outlaw. And where is Colin Brock? When will he see me? In due time. He's usually gone for just a day or two. It's not really helpful, but okay. Ma'am, I I appreciate your kindness. Uh, We will avail ourselves of this fine town's uh, amenities, and we will seek you out forthwith. (laughs) (laughs) Chuck getting after it with the language of the era. That I just throw off the top of the dome? That's how I bring this podcast. (laughs) And Grace clasps her hands together and nods toward the group. Be well. I know you all need rest. Now that is accurate. For my own clarity, you're opting to explore Olvido on your own for now? That's what Johnny would like to do? Do y'all want to check into the hotel and drop off some things before we look around? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'll walk the group over to the hotel, maybe avoiding the crowd if we can. Okay. Although they aren't really trying to bother you. And the Fulton Place Hotel, it's maybe just a one or two minute walk from where you were speaking to Grace. That man who spoke to y'all earlier is tying Eric to the hitching post as you approach. And he gives you a quick wave of the hand. He looks really excited. 
As far as you can tell so far, this hotel is the only place to stay in Oviedo. It's an old adobe building, at least a hundred years old, you would think, but the signage looks new. There's wooden railing running around the veranda on the ground level and the second story of the building. From the number of windows, you'd guess that there are 15 to 20 rooms altogether. As you step through the large red doors into the lobby, you see an adobe fireplace in the center of the room. You could pass around that on either side. There are two comfy looking chairs and a small table in front of the fireplace. Off to the right, there's a longer dining table with four chairs, and it looks like there's some clean glassware set on the table. There's a wheel chandelier hovering above that setup. There are three huge colorful rugs spread across the floor with various geometric patterns. These look like Mexican patterns to you. One of them is running along the staircase to your left, and there's a short corridor that opens beneath those stairs. This hotel looks quite decent. As you pass by the empty fireplace, you'll see that the main desk is about eight feet across and has a wide countertop. There are double doors with big glass windows on each side of the desk. A woman is standing behind that desk, and she's smiling as you approach. She's probably in her late 30s, and she looks a little disheveled, actually. She has brown hair, she's wearing a well-worn suit. It's gray, it has these fraying yellow roses embroidered on the skirt. It kind of reminds you of a show costume. I say, uh, evening, ma'am. Name's Johnny Rhodes. I expect you are expecting me. You all must be the bishop party. I am Isabel Fulton, at your service. Welcome to the Fulton Place Hotel. I'm sorry, the bishop party? Yes, ma'am. That's what I have in my book. They told me there would be five of you, but this adorable baby is a surprise. Ma'am, have you installed all the proper child safety mechanisms? (laughs) Be mindful of the windows and the veranda, sir. You will be staying on the second floor. None of the furniture is tethered to the wall. And the electrical outlets are non-existent? (laughs) (laughs) You'd be right about that, but you will find a bathtub in the suites, which can be hazardous to young ones. Keep a close watch on her and she'll be fine. And how is it you know the baby's a girl? I know by my eyes. She is a precious doll. Ma'am, I'm afraid I am terribly behind on my correspondence. Could you direct me to the post office or somewhere where I could send uh, some United States mail? The general store across the road. I can take it there if you'd like, unless you're planning to stretch your legs later. Johnny is interested in the general store. I'll go to the general store um, if we want to start there. Okay. Would you like to finish checking in here before you head out? Sure. Ma'am, it's been a journey. Can we go ahead and get our room keys? She looks down and turns through a few pages in her book. Let's see. You've caught me in an awkward moment here. We only have three suites at our hotel. Would any of you like to pair off or take a standard room? Everything is complimentary, of course. Uh, Well, the baby and I will take one of the suites. <laughs> <laughs> Look, if anybody else wants to sleep with an infant, I fucking dare you. <laughs> I, I'm i down to share a room with someone. We can just drink whiskey all night. Again, reminisce on what's been an incredible week that will probably end uh, very soon. You want a room together, father? That'd be great. Uh, cup, real quick. Yeah. Uh, do I have any drugs left? I can't remember. I hope you do. Oh. I think you did have just a little bit after the campfire, but this is going to be the last of it, let's say. All right, uh, Jeremiah, come on up. Let's (laughs) let's get ripped. (laughs) Okay, that leaves one more suite. Ellie can have the suite. I'll be having a smaller room if that's all right. Yes, good idea. I'll do just fine with the suite. That all sounds fine. Sir, Mr. Kilkenny, you'll be adjacent around the corner from the suites on the back of the building. And 
Here are the keys. From the keys, it looks like Johnny's in 204, Ellie in 205, Flint and Jeremiah in 206, and Lance in room 207, the non-suite. So Ellie being right next to Johnny could be helpful if he runs into parenting trouble. Oh, I'm going to have earplugs in. I'm not even going to notice. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how I know you're a seasoned parent. Johnny leans down and says, See, honey, mommy doesn't even want you around. <laughs> I've been carrying her all day. It's your turn. <laughs> uh, ma'am, if you wouldn't mind sending up a bassinet, that would be fine. Uh, we don't have anything like that available at the moment. We don't need that. You can just put her in a drawer. Just put a blanket in there. Sure. Sure, we'll do that. <laughs> and then you close the drawer and go party all night. <laughs> Baby's there every time. <laughs> well, it sounds like you've worked it out. Meals are included, so you're welcome to join us for breakfast at 7. If you need anything, we'll be here overnight. Ring the bell if there's nobody at the desk. And she gives the bell a ring just to show you how that works. And she said we. So that does draw your attention now to a little girl sitting on the floor behind the desk. She pops up from this thick book she's reading, waves, and sits down again. Gah! Oh, hey there. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been there the whole time? She nods, but then it's nose right back down in the book. Sorry about that. I lost my manners. That's Nina. She won't cause you no trouble, and she's a good helper. Aren't you, dear? Yeah, Nina doesn't even acknowledge this. She was a snake. She would have jumped up and bit me. She's a mousy girl, probably between 10 and 12 years old, and she's dressed like a kid in the 1890s. <laughs> no further description <laughs> required. <laughs> I think you know where to go. You can't miss the rooms at the top of the stairs. Do have a pleasant evening. We will. Cool, cool. All right. Good shit. All right. We'll talk to you guys tomorrow. If you're heading into your respective rooms, then you will be impressed by the suites, which are about as nice as the room you had, Father Flint in Las Cruces. Is there a phonograph? Yeah. What does a suite mean? Like, is that is there a kitchenette? Is there a pull-out sofa? There's a bathtub in each suite, so that's really nice. These rooms are spacious, they're well-appointed, the beds are large and clean, you have views of the gorge and the distant plains. Although in hindsight, maybe they should have put the suites on the mountainside, which would have a better view, but here we are. And there are large mirrors, and you know, Lance's standard room isn't half bad. It's just a little bit cramped and without all of these amenities. Is there something I can play these Baby Einsteins videos <laughs> on? <laughs> yeah, you know, you have your iPad. <laughs> if no one else has any thoughts, I'm going to the general store, I guess, with Father Flynn. Yeah, hell yeah, let's go. Sure, you could drop some things off and then head back into town. Yeah, let's all go to the store. Maybe we can get some milk or something for Birdie. Uh, I'm going I'm going with you guys. General Sword is. Okay, as you leave the hotel and go back onto that main thoroughfare, you'll notice that things are eerily quiet now. There's nobody around, really. You do see the general store across the way. This is an unremarkable wooden building with a short porch and a large window displaying some of the goods. Painted on the front of the building, you'll see them advertising some of the things they have inside, including a post office. They have dry goods, they have vegetables, they have nails, all kinds of good things inside. The porch is empty, and you think that maybe there were some things out here earlier, so maybe it's near closing time and they brought those things back inside. When you enter the store, you see the usual things you'd expect behind a U-shaped counter. Fabric, tools, food items, all the necessities. I'm going to go find whoever is the, like, person running this store. That would be fine. There's an older gentleman straight ahead behind the counter. 
He's wearing spectacles and does look up from whatever he's reading just to give you a nod and a faint smile. Then he goes back to his book. You know, you don't recognize him from your arrival. He wasn't at the welcoming parade as far as you can recall. Okay. No, that that's important to me. He was not out there with everyone else. He was not. Maybe he was minding the store. Johnny would like to go up to him and say, Good day, sir. Um, I was wondering if this might be the right place to inquire about postal services in this town. Huh. Yeah, I suppose it is. Let me think here for a moment. Uh, what day is this? I believe it is Sunday, sir. I understand if it will not leave until tomorrow. Hmm. Tomorrow? Hmm. Maybe. When does it need to arrive? As soon as it possibly can. Well, it'll leave town this week. I could promise you that. All right, that would be fine, sir. Can I get an idea of if it looks like he's a crazy Branch Brockvidian or if he's just a normal dude? Oh, like the parade clappers? No, he seems pretty normal, but maybe a bit absent-minded? Okay. While everyone else is doing their thing, Johnny is going to write a letter to whoever his superiors were. Okay. Back at the Department of the Interior. Dave? (laughs) We'll say Dave. Good old Dave. Explaining literally everything. Had Johnny already told the department what happened in North Carolina? Yeah, well, they're aware of that. Yeah, they're aware of that. Okay, so just the new things that have developed. Yeah, since then. The store clerk is happy to offer Johnny whatever we're writing with in the 1890s. Uh, Charcoal and and paper. (laughs) I also, I include a charcoal drawing of Sinead just because it was important to me that they understood. (laughs) Name's Ulysses if you need anything. Thank you, Ulysses. I appreciate your help. Big group. Does anyone else have questions? Uh, Do you think we need any food or anything or anyone need any weapons before whatever? Do you sell weapons here by any chance? Eh, Can't rightly say we stock weapons. Oviedo's a peaceful place, mostly a mining town around here. Used to get folks passing through from Albuquerque, would stop off for supplies in the saloon. So what are they mining? Well, we had a lot of luck with iron around here, but that luck's mostly dried up, I'm afraid. Town's gotten a little bit smaller, but we stay tight-knit. Had you heard of us before? I feel like we've been talking about you guys for a year now. A whole year. How's that bar? (laughs) Oh, the Angry Bird Saloon? The Angry Bird. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Is that the one next to the Candy Crush Salon? (laughs) (laughs) Clash of Clans Blacksmith? Just head over to Farmville. You'll find Colin Brock there. (laughs) Is there anything else you need? Yes, do you have baby supplies? Well, let's see. I might have some... Yep, I have some bonnets. Yes, I'll take two bonnets. And do you know someone in town who is breastfeeding and isn't crazy? Isn't crazy? Hmm. Let me think on that. That's not really a service I can provide. (laughs) No, I'm not saying it's a service you offer. Do you know a woman who recently gave birth and would be able to breastfeed a baby? Can't say that I do know anyone like that. Alex, give me a psychology check for Ellie. Let's see if she's picking up anything here. Yes, I got a 22. Regular success. Okay, nice. So Ellie is pretty sure that he's not being truthful about this. I think you're hiding something. Why don't you tell me what that is? Give me intimidate. Regular success again. 
Well, 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 okay, Sheriff. Okay, let's settle down now. There is Mary Stratford, I suppose. Uh, I did not tell you that. Where does she live? She's outside town. Uh, Stratford's got a little ranch a little ways past the bridge there. Uh, what are y'all planning to do there? I am unable to produce my own milk for my child. And animal milk in this day and age is easily contaminated, and I don't want my baby to die. <laughs> oh, Miss Knowledge! <laughs> Cup, is this why you gave me 85 lactation? <laughs> <laughs> and no one's been willing to say anything about it up until now. If that's all, I'm going to start packing up the store for the evening. Wait, wait. No, I need a hammer. Give me a hammer. I want a hammer for my sickle. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, Father. Now, the hammers have been out back next to the barrel of nails, so if it's a little dirty or rusty, you understand. That's fine. Just, I mean, if anyone else wants a hammer, put it on my tab. Uh, but I'll take a hammer, just in case. And the clerk rings everyone up, and this was a rather inexpensive trip to the store. How's that letter coming along for Johnny? Would you like to share what it says, or is that private? No, I mean, it literally is saying all of the things that happened, and explaining that we have found a situation that is a threat to national security, and that they need to send... Uh, the FBI probably doesn't exist right now. Um, I don't think so. They need to send... The Pinkertons? They need to send the gumshoes <laughs> and the Pinkertons and whoever else they've got <laughs> to Olvido, New Mexico. I'm calling in the cavalry is what I'm doing. And they will arrive long after we die. I'm going to lay down $10... What? And I'm going to tell him whatever is the fastest that your ponies can take this express. Uh, our most expensive expedited mail service is eight cents. Well, then you keep the rest, my good man, and make sure that this arrives. <laughs> he takes the money in the letter and runs out the back door. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. He puts on his coat. Lock up when you're done. <laughs> He's fucking gone. <laughs> all right. Well, I guess, boys, we can take all the hammers we want. now. You think he's probably going to give that to somebody else in town who can make sure this gets out fast. Okay. Hey, this is the first NPC who's ever liked you. <laughs> <laughs> By the time you finish up at the general store, it's about six o'clock in the evening. Let's let's go have drinks and food. Yeah, no, that's completely fine with me. They probably serve food at the hotel since it was meals inclusive, but you're not sure about supper because Isabel told you to come down for breakfast, so maybe you missed that. They might serve food at the Angry Bird Saloon. Can we bring a baby into the bar? That's probably okay, and it's early, so you wouldn't expect it to be too rowdy at the saloon. <laughs> this is the 1800s. You can bring a Wolverine in a fucking bar. It doesn't matter. Let's go. <laughs> it's not drinking hours yet. <laughs> if you have enough money in the 1800s, it is drinking hours. New town. Let's go get drunk again. <laughs> That's fine. Y'all can go get drunk again instead of moving the story <laughs> forward. When you leave the general store to head over to the saloon, you'll just need to cross the road back to the hotel side. The road splits off here and runs between the hotel and the saloon. The Angry Bird Saloon is another wooden building with two steps leading up to the porch. The front of the building is narrow with batwing saloon doors, and from that, the sides extend outward with windows and a porch that wraps around on both sides. If you do decide to take a quick peek through a window or maybe over the doors, you'll notice that it looks empty. There are tables and the bar seems stocked. You just don't see any people. Maybe they've closed? It's pretty dark inside. 
and the sun is casting these long shadows across the walls and the floor. That sounds inviting. Nothing can go wrong. Let's just open the door. Yeah. As you walk in, you see poker tables to your left and right, and the chips have all been put away. Straight ahead, there are round tops, standard tables. A longer rectangular table for a large group is at the back left next to a staircase. On your right, past those poker tables, there's an L-shaped bar with eight stools. It doesn't look like there's anyone standing behind the bar. Okay, are there glasses back there? (laughs) So we can just start pouring our own drinks. Reckon we could just start drinking if nobody's here. As Jeremiah says that, you did yell that out, right? Yeah. (laughs) Okay, moments after Jeremiah calls out, a red door swings open near the far end of the bar, maybe from a storeroom or a kitchen, and this guy walks out. He's average height, wearing a black vest and tie over a white shirt. He has a handlebar mustache and a white apron. His dark hair is slicked back a little bit. It looks like the bartender. And his expression tells you that he's surprised to see you all standing there when he comes out. He's squinting, and he's looking toward you, Lance. Lance kill Kenny? I can't believe my eyes. Is that really you, bud? Allegedly. Lance, I didn't think I'd ever see you again, brother. <laughs> Get on in here, all of you. Now, Lance, you do recognize that voice. And now that you're kind of looking at him, he used to wear a full beard, but you know this guy. He used to run in Brock's gang with you. This is Dylan Heath. He was in the gang at the same time you were, but you weren't super close to this guy. You did a few jobs together. His his name's Dylan Heath? Yep, his name's Dylan Heath, but he likes to call himself Dust Devil. Oh, God. (laughs) What an idiot. (laughs) Wait, but why? Why is he Dust Devil? (laughs) Maybe he sells vacuum cleaners. Yeah, he's the Dirt Devil. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's like a little mini tornado thing looking. But yeah, Dust Devil's a little dust storm. But it does it doesn't it's not fast enough to do any actual damage. Nevertheless, he's very proud of that name. That's so sad. All right. Lance, it's me. Dust Devil. I'm sorry. I don't know who you are. Are you serious right now? No, you're pulling my leg. Nope, don't know who you are. And he steps out from behind the bar so you can get a better look at him. Lance, you'll remember that Dust Devil was never very talkative. And in fact, he seemed standoffish most of the time with you. He was usually picking fights and stirring up trouble. What's your name? You were the best man at my (laughs) wedding. It's me, the Dust Devil. (laughs) (laughs) And he does a pirouette. (laughs) Ryerson! Uh, you'll have to you'll have to forgive me. I've taken a few knocks on the head in recent days. Tell me again. Uh, uh, you said dust devil, <laughs> and then there was a lot of laughter. <laughs> what did you want to talk about there, uh, dust devil? And do you have another name? Because I don't think I can keep calling you dust devil. It's fucking stupid. Well, I suppose you always called me Dylan. That'd be fine. (laughs) Very well. I'm pretty sure Dylan wasn't a name back then, but... Well, uh, we'll just call him Dust Devil for now, then. (laughs) 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 We'll call you Dust Devil for now. We'll get you a good name in post. (laughs) And who might y'all be? Yeah, they call me the Swamp Thing. (laughs) <laughs> I'm Pickaxe McGee. <laughs> I'm Hammer and Sickle. <laughs> yeah, they call me Land Shark because I don't need water, just whiskey. <laughs> but suddenly, Ole Miss makes so much more sense to me <laughs> just now. 
<laughs> Don't need water, just whiskey. Okay, yeah, land sharks, I get it. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'll do my best to remember your names. What will you be drinking? I've got whiskey, and I've got gin. And, uh, yep, looks like more gin. <laughs> Can you make a mojito? <laughs> I'm fresh out of mint, uh, the swamp thing. Sorry about that. Hang on, let me roll for luck to see if I have mint. <laughs> no, <Nope>, I don't. <laughs> I'd like a slow gin fizz. What about a uh, little <laughs> apple daiquiri? <laughs> Something sweet. Uh, yep, don't have no apples. Sorry, hammer and sickle. <laughs> he could make an old fashioned. That was around in the day. An old fashioned. Where are you from, uh, miss? What's in that? In Oviedo, they call that a newfangled. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. It has bitters and a sugar cube and some orange zest and a peel, and that's it. You do not muddle fruit in the bottom, as a lot of people like to do. If you put a cherry in an old-fashioned, get out of my life forever. <laughs> oh, sure. Uh, I'll make you one, but uh, uh, actually, does one of you want to run across the street and grab an orange? I, I've got a lemon. What kind of bar is this? Actually, a lemon was the original way they made an old-fashioned, so let's just go with that. Jesus, old miss. All right. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, damn, Lance. What brings you to old Vito? Well, uh, we we were just passing through this other town, uh, thinking about going to visit those those caverns they talked about over Carlos, by the way. Oh, sure, those are nice. Yeah, you're not uh, here to see him. Who's him? Brock. He's a uh, he's here. You know, you know, right, Lance? Oh, well, hey, well, um, is he around? I reckon I seen him around a week ago. I think he's been holed up in the house, but. I don't readily know. Grace told me he's been out running around getting ready for something. Who's Grace? (laughs) Well, didn't y'all meet Grace when you got here? Does she have breast milk? (laughs) I'm sorry, what? (laughs) Can you make a white Russian? (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) Could could y'all run that drink order by me one more time? We'll take two fingers neat with a squeeze of lemon on each. Thank you. That sounds great. Okay, that does sound great. Sure thing, ma'am, a land shark. Dust Devil is like a magician putting these drinks together. He turns around with five perfect drinks in about the time it would take most bartenders to make just one. What about this house? You said Brock's in a house? Where is it? Well, if you follow this road down a little further between the Angry Bird and the hotel, it's on your left. Okay. Uh, are y'all uh, hungry, or did you just stop in for drinks? <laughs> yeah, can you uh, can, can you rustle me up a Reuben? Yeah, that'd be great. I'd like uh, eggs Benedict for myself. Who now? Oh, we're on a bit of a limited menu right now. We haven't been doing a whole lot of business. Actually, I'm paleo. I'd like a poke <laughs> bowl with no rice and maybe some avocado. <laughs> well, paleo we can do. I'll get you something you'll love. Hey, Liddy! Give me five plates of the special. Oh, does the baby need anything? Not unless you have uncontaminated milk. Ah, uh, nope. We don't have anything like that. But, um, maybe check over at the corral? Birdie seems fine. Uh, she hasn't really eaten anything or cried for that matter since Johnny pulled her out of the ground. All right, we don't need milk. That's fine. The baby's probably the devil anyway. But Johnny is now wondering if you're the right motherly figure. <laughs> As you just said that she might be the devil. Johnny didn't carry this baby in his body for nine months. Neither did you. That's irrelevant. (laughs) Irrelevant. (laughs) Johnny is super weirded out right now. (laughs) Y'all, I think I'm having another aphasia, but weirder. (laughs) Hey, how'd you get that stupid ass nickname? Oh. Well, uh, what nickname's that? Dust Devil. That dumbass thing you keep calling yourself. How'd you get that? Oh. Well, I'm surprised to hear you call it stupid. 
Look, just tell me how, how you came about being called that. I suppose I self-appointed the name. You gave yourself the nickname of Dust Devil? <laughs> well, yeah. You could have chose anything. <laughs> you could have been any... You call yourself Dust Devil? I, I thought it was fearsome, because I was in a gang, and we were in the dust, you know? I, I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you, to be honest, we have all made fun of that nickname behind your back from the start. <laughs> you gotta do it to his face, man. <laughs> You gotta help a man out. I, I, I am a changed man myself, and I, I would love to help you with this. Uh, let's let's go ahead and start workshopping you a new nickname. Uh, Dust Devil's shoulders are slumped. He looks dejected, but he's forcing a smile. Hey, hey, Dirt Dylan, where are we at on that food? <laughs> Let me check on that food. Hey, Liddy, you got something for me? Uh, it'll just be five minutes or so longer on that. Did you think that it would strike fear in your enemies to hear that the dust devil was a coming? <laughs> Man, I don't know. I was 16 when I picked it. You're a big obnoxious tornado that does nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate the sentiment, Pickaxe McGee. Why aren't you looking at me, devil? <laughs> Give me an intimidate roll for Jeremiah to see if you can talk him into changing his nickname. Oh, I have to roll to be a smartass? Okay. Oh, okay. All right. I got a, uh, oh, I failed. I got a 31. <laughs> you were so excited. I was so pumped. I thought I had something in intimidate, but I don't. <laughs> well, you see, the Dust Devil brought me this far to own in this fine saloon, which I also named the Angry Bird Saloon. <laughs> the food is catapulted out of the kitchen and knocks you off the bar stools. <laughs> no, but Dust Devil does go grab those plates from the kitchen. He sets those down in front of you, and the presentation isn't much, but the food is incredible. This meat is tender, it has this sweet and salty flavor. The vegetables served with it are kind of pathetic, some undercooked potatoes and greens, but this ham steak is amazing. Eating it is almost euphoric. It's so good. You've almost forgotten why you're here. This is going to poison us, right? This is we're gonna... <laughs> <laughs> This is 100% like Island of the Lotus Eaters vibes right now. <laughs> Am I getting a hit point? Am I leveling up because the ham steak is so good? Only if you eat three more bites, big boy. <laughs> no, no hit point. And I'm trying to feed the potatoes to Birdie. <laughs> <laughs> Are you mashing up those potatoes first? I'm baby birding some of this food over to Bertrand. <laughs> but does Birdie react when he tries to feed her? She's not interested. Say, can I get y'all anything else? Uh, I ain't gonna lie, Dirt Dog, this is the best ham steak I've had in a while. Yeah, I reckon it's fine and tasty. Uh, so, what's that weird music we heard when we got here? Uh, what do you mean? You know when you kick a bagpiper down a hill? <laughs> Sounded like that. Oh, they probably threw a band together when they seen you coming. Not everybody enjoys music, I know. Okay, but uh, most are at least trained to recognize our rhythm. Hey, and what and what were they clapping their hands for after the music stopped? Well, I was here watching the bar when y'all arrived, so I'm not sure. Uh, is that is that the case? Okay, Jay, give me a psychology roll here, since Lance seems skeptical. I uh, I rolled a twenty-five. Hell yeah! Out of fifty, okay. Yes. That's a hard success. <laughs> <laughs> the one time it's coming handy. On the hard success, Lance, you know that he's uncomfortable with these questions about the music. He knows it's bad, but he doesn't want to talk about it for some reason. Listen, listen, Dust Devil. I, I, I can't get over that name. Uh, I apologize. Uh, listen, Dust Devil, uh, you, you, you know something about this music. There's got to be a reason they're playing it so poorly. I get it, I get it, Lance. The music's not that good. <laughs> Tell you what, I'll talk to Grace to see if we can put a better band together. 
No, 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 no. I don't want you to talk to Grace about this. I want to know why. Why they insist on playing <laughs> that music if it's so bad in the first place. Maybe nobody here has a good ear for tuning an instrument. Uh, I'm not sure. Lance, this isn't my area. You should really ask Grace. DD, uh, can, you, <laughs> can you tell me, uh, when, when did this Father Colin Brock stuff start? Yeah, yeah, you know Brock, he, uh... Well, he ain't the man you remember him to be, Lance. Say, like, Quim, speak privately for just a few minutes here, Lance. Hmm. <laughs> and, then you, and then you slide him a key. Ain't slayed after dark. Sorry. <laughs> I don't feel right talking to strangers about our past. I, I tell you what, fellas, if you don't mind, I think I want to try to find out a little bit more about the situation. And I, I've, I kind of turn uh, to my, my friend group. And I, I say to them, listen, I don't believe this for a second, but maybe I should find out more. Maybe for some reason they believe they can trust me. I don't know. This is the strangest happening I've ever had. All right. Well, if something happens, it's been great hanging out with you this week. So um, talk to you soon. Yep. Okay, Lance. Dust Devil is going to lead you to that big rectangular table near the back of the saloon. And here you'll be able to chat out of earshot from the rest of the group. Oof, Lance, I could find someone to patch you up. That wound looks terrible. It would happen to be one of you who took a shot at me. No, 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 no way. We don't use guns no more, Lance. Well, we're peaceful now. We got no need for guns. And that, and that reminds me, why have things changed for you so much? See, Lance, Colin, he's, um... He's different now. He's gentle. He's a changed man. He, like, he woke up one day, and oh, he's just been so good for this town, Lance. Oh my god, he's gonna be so happy to see you. He always liked you, Lance. He, it kinda broke him when you left, but he picked up those broken pieces, and we made something better. Even when you was in the gang, Brock was beginning to learn more about the way the world really works. I don't get to talk with him one-on-one -on -one much anymore, but... I guess he's too important for old Dust Devil. He's so focused now. He found his life's purpose. And what is that life's purpose? Well, it's complicated, Lance. I don't even know if I can explain it to you. But uh, I, I'm still confused. It seems like such a quick turnaround that he uh, that he has found this this life's purpose, as you say, so quickly. He had a revelation, Lance. He can describe everything to you so much better than I can. But you need to be careful, Lance. You come in here dressed like that, armed to the teeth, I just want to make sure you don't get into any trouble that you're not looking for. You need to know how things work here. And how exactly does Elvito work? Everything here has a structure, and you don't want to step out of line. I know you talk to Grace. She runs the town, really. But everything comes down the mountain. Look, Lance, you're an old friend. I don't want to see you do anything misguided. And what would you have to mean by misguided? Well, when you left the gang, Lance, when you left us, it wasn't on the best terms. And I don't know what the hell went through your head, so I want to make sure you ain't showing up here in Olvido with some convoluted idea of revenge or something. All right? And seeing who you come into my bar with... I gotta know, Lance. They know the things you've done? Do they know all the things you've done? Uh, I try to keep things on the up and up, per se. I, I, I try to only reveal relevant information. I'm sure you can relate to that yourself, uh, considering the gaps and the stories that you've been spinning. But uh, I digress. What about the sheriff? How'd you come to find yourself in her little traveling group? Uh, to be to be truthful, I, I think it was was fate that brought us together. So you do believe in fate? Well, that's real good, Lance. I, I think there's something that guides our our paths. And speaking of fate, 
You knew we didn't leave on the best of terms, yet you talked to me like an old friend. Why is that? I don't know, Lance. I suppose, um, Olvido was a place of redemption. I hoped maybe you'd come back around. Maybe we could be a family again. I always looked to you as an older brother, Lance. Did you not feel the same way? <laughs> Truth be told, I didn't think you were that fond of me. Even before I decided to make my own path. I'm sorry if I came off that way, Lance. I, maybe the pressures of the gang and always trying to one-up each other turned me into the wrong sort of person. You know, I'd never do anything to hurt you. Buddy, I, I need you to tell me what it is you need me to do. I just need you to play nice and give this a chance. And I'm glad you didn't come in here shooting your guns, because that would have got real ugly. I need you to be patient and uh, open-minded. Maybe you can see what I see. Show proper respect to the folks you meet here and don't go in there screaming at Colin. I need you to listen. I don't know what your goals are here, Lance, but don't forget what he knows about you. You've given me a lot to think about. Uh, I, th- I think it's time for me to to call it a night. Yeah, I'm sorry you never got a cool nickname, Lance. <laughs> I think maybe we could have been a little bit closer if you had. I'm joking with you, Lance. Come on. Now, let me go see your friends off. Well, thanks for letting me catch up with Lance. Uh, I'll be around the saloon if you need to wet your whistle. Well, anyway, we're going to head to the hotel and we'll probably be out of town by tomorrow. Oh, you all want me to stop by for a nightcap? Nope. No, no we're <laughs> cool, Dust Devil. <laughs> that is weird. We do appreciate the offer. Yeah. We, we ain't into whatever it is that you're into. Why don't you just take your cyclone and go down the road a piece and go on and get? <laughs> All right, then. Well, it's good to see you, Lance, and uh, meet your new friends. Uh, good to see you as well, uh, uh, Dil- Dylan. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what time of day is it? It's a little after 7 o'clock now. 7 o'clock? We gotta put this little girl down. Ellie, what are you doing? (laughs) Has she been awake the whole time? Birdie hasn't slept yet. She's just kind of watching. (laughs) That is a little bit odd, I'd say. Okay, Lance, everybody. I'll see you soon. All right, sounds good. Can't wait to kill that guy later, guys. <laughs> uh, Johnny is going to go make sure that uh, Birdie gets put down for bed. Yeah, let's get some sleep. Okay, that's easy enough. The hotel is just across the road. When you walk into the lobby, everything is quiet. And heading upstairs to your rooms, all of the keys work. And I'm picturing you all synchronized as you unlock, open, and close the doors. If you left any of your belongings in the room, you'll notice that now they're neatly arranged on the desk. Johnny, your pamphlet is sitting there, and Ellie, your journal. Okay, I'm I'm putting Bertie to bed in the drawer. I'm putting Father Flint to bed in the drawer. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's all part of it for them. Johnny, you can pull out one of the drawers and line it with blankets and pillows and set Birdie right in there. Damn right. And of course, Birdie's an angel. She's not fussing at all. My daughter is perfect. To you, she is. The way these rooms are laid out, the suites face the southern side of town, the gorge and bridge that you rode in on. And at this point, everyone except for Lance, who isn't staying on that side... Give me a spot hidden roll. See if you notice anything as you draw the curtains for the night or take one last look outside. I rolled a 39. Uh, I rolled a five, which is certainly an extreme success. What's a 51? Did I succeed? I don't think that's a success for me. All right. Jeremiah succeeded? Yeah. Yeah. Just a regular. Ellie and Jeremiah. It's summertime and the sun hasn't quite set yet. 
and you're going to see black smoke rising in the distance. You know there's a large fire, but it's not in Olvido. This isn't coming from the corral or anything like that. It's too distant. You can't really make out any details or estimate the distance, but you see it. Now, Johnny, on the extreme success, you've got those eagle eyes, don't you? I do. You are certain, Johnny, that this smoke is coming from a fire at the ranch you visited. Maybe it's that abandoned barn. Maybe it's the house. Maybe it's both. You're not sure. Uh, I'm going to look over to see if Birdie is reacting in some way. No, Birdie can't see anything. She's in the drawer. And even if you pick her up and show her the smoke, she's not going to respond to it. Pick up the child. Show her. Show her. Make her watch. (laughs) (laughs) This is what I saved you from. (laughs) Look at it. That's got to be a comfort that you saved her from this. Okay. Hush, little baby, (laughs) don't say a word. (laughs) Your home is burning down, my little bird. (laughs) This might be the first reaction you've ever really gotten out of Birdie, but Johnny, she does reach up and stroke the bottom of your chin with one cold finger as you sing. God, she's adorable. (laughs) She is going to eat your face. That's fine. She's so cute. I'd let her. It's a sweet moment. Is Jeremiah telling Father Flint about the smoke? Maybe he's too busy getting his drug station set up. Yeah. Yeah, are you going to tell me something? Hey. (laughs) When you're around, there's smoke. (laughs) Hell, look out this window here. You see that smoke? Uh, uh... Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I do see that smoke. Pour me another whiskey. And as you continue settling down, maybe some of you've already climbed into bed. Lance is probably asleep. That's the idea. Give me a listen check, and it doesn't matter what side of the building you're on. This is for everyone, including Lance. I got an 83 fail. That's a success on a 45. Uh, I got a fail. I rolled a six. So. I rolled a 99. <laughs> 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 okay. Lance, let's put a pin in the 99. Um, <laughs> my, my ears fall off. Oh, now that I hadn't considered. While everyone else in the suites is seeing the smoke on the horizon... Father Flint is attuned to his other senses. I think you've done some coke, if I'm not mistaken. Father Flint, you hear loud banging sounds coming from beneath the room, maybe on the first floor there. And on the six, there's an echo that might make you wonder if the sound is traveling through something, maybe some kind of duct. Do you hear that? Do you hear Do you hear that? I don't hear anything. What are you talking about? You don't hear that? I don't know. Hearing this? Hearing what? Should I go downstairs and investigate? That's up to you. Are you asking me? (laughs) I'm gonna bring. I'm gonna bring you along. So, all right. Well, let's bump some of that coke first. (laughs) All right. Let's do it. I'm down for that. All right. Uh, I don't. We don't need to roll for that, do we? Scoob and the gang are gonna go check it out. Oh, so like Scoob. (laughs) Johnny, you hear a faint noise. It's like banging on wood. And it's coming from downstairs, but this building seems pretty old from the outside, and you might think it's just settling. (laughs) A different kind of bump in the night. (laughs) (laughs) Johnny is going to peek out the door, but he's not going anywhere if Birdie's in here. Okay. It was a successful bump, and now we're going downstairs to to check it out. Downstairs, right? So we're we're going down the stairs. Okay. You head out into the hallway, which is empty, and then go down the stairwell, which puts you off on the left-hand side of the lobby. You might remember there's a corridor splitting off to the left under the stairs. 
If you were standing at the front desk and turned left, you'd be heading down that corridor. Father, you might think that's the location of the noise, because that's right underneath the landing in front of your room. You do notice that Isabel Fulton, the hotel proprietor you met earlier, she's standing behind the front desk, and she looks up as you approach. And if you do look off to the left, you'll see a closed, solid wooden door at the end of that corridor. You think that door probably lines up about where your room door would be. We're going in that door. You did say there was a person at the desk. Yes, and she'll address the two of you. Hey, boys, can I help you with something? It's getting late. Yeah, 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 ma'am, 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 ma'am. There was a noise. Did you hear it? No. What kind of noise? It was just loud. It was just like a loud crashing sound. You're telling me you didn't hear that noise. You didn't hear the crash, the loud crash. I didn't hear anything. Did you check with your neighbors? Mr. Rhodes or Miss Bishop, perhaps? No, we're checking with you, the front desk. You work here. You might you might have knowledge of noise. I didn't hear a thing. Would you like me to look in your room to make sure there aren't any problems? Sidebar, Wes, do we want her to come with us to the door, or at least... Or do we want to keep that a secret and just kind of do it without asking? I kind of like to keep it a secret and do it without asking. Okay. No... No no need for you to come up to our rooms. All good. We'll come back down if we hear it again, but uh, we appreciate it. You have, a, you have a good night. Yeah, we're fine. We're fine. We're fine. Thank you so much. So much. Have a good, good night. Uh, okay. Y'all get some sleep now. Do you need any extra towels? We're fine on towels. I'll take a towel. <laughs> I'll take one towel. <laughs> I just need to up my inventory. I have no idea what we're going to get into behind this door. So let me just get one towel, please. No, wait, I'll take, an, I'll take a towel. Okay, Isabel turns around and grabs two towels from a cabinet behind the desk. There you are. Why don't both of you give me psychology checks on Isabel's reaction to this noise inquiry? Sure. Okay. I rolled a 95, so that can't be I rolled a 94? <laughs> so, <laughs> we're just really high right now. Yeah, you're not. You're not picking up anything interesting. We have a towel, and we've distracted her, and now we... I mean, so how... Can she see the door from her vantage point? Oh, for sure. If you're planning to walk down that hallway in plain sight, she's going to see that. Okay. So, okay, how how... how is she strong looking woman? Is she a fast looking woman? Like Oh what? no, what are you wanting to do? Uh, she seems healthy <laughs> and pretty strong. Maybe a bit tired. Can we have her like can we complain about the noise next to us or something? She just like go up and like reprimand somebody. I'm just trying to get her upstairs. Cause I don't want her to go to our room and see all the drugs, right? We should send her to uh Johnny's room. Because <laughs> she'll be preoccupied with the baby. Right. Everybody gets preoccupied with the baby. Let's do it. I like it. All right. That baby upstairs is crying a lot. It's crying a lot. Is there any way you could go up and maybe talk to him really fast to tell the baby to maybe quiet down? Or if you have maybe a, a I don't know, <laughs> a, baby, a warm towel or something for the baby maybe to quiet it down, to swaddle it in, that would be really helpful. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, I just gave you two towels. Oh, it's not warm. And it's not for it's not for the baby. This is for me. Oh, of course. Maybe I'm mistaken, but aren't you all friends? Not friends enough to mess with the baby. We really would need your proprietorship to help us out there. I am dressed nice. Does Jeremiah have any game? Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Man, we ain't told you or nothing, but we're prolific treasure hunters. And uh, on our journey, we're probably going to get untold riches. And if you are to bring that baby a warm towel uh, just right about now, we will bring you back something that would uh, really improve your investment in this hotel. Roll. All right. <laughs> She's thinking about it. Wes, give me a persuade roll for Jeremiah to see if 
Isabel's interested in untold prospective treasures. It worked on y'all with Wilkinson. 49. I generally passed. <laughs> okay, so it's a regular success? With that bullshit. Okay, might as well. Nina, you watch the desk while I check on Mr. Rhodes and his baby. Shit. Yeah, that little girl who scared Johnny earlier pops up again from behind the desk where she was studying. And as Isabel heads toward the stairs for a visit with Johnny, Nina stares at the two of you. We didn't count on Nina, did we? You ever go behind that door, Nina? (laughs) Yeah, can Nina go help? How do we distract Nina? Do we need to distract Nina? Can we just convince Nina that we need to go in that door real quick? Well, as you two work it out, let's visit Johnny in his room earlier in the evening. Uh, I would like to review my uh, that pamphlet full of crazy mythos shit, the spell book. Good. So this is that miniature tome that you picked up from Ida's roadside curio stand. And you got several hours of reading time in during your ride to Oviedo. What are you doing with the book now? I'm hoping to learn some magic spells. I have established that there's probably magic spells in here and I want in on that. Right. You didn't understand the language, but based on diagrams and the way the book is organized, Johnny decided this book contains spells. Mm hmm. Now, with this focused study tonight, and it is focused because Birdie's not making a sound. Okay. Well, as a parent, I can say, quiet child, that's fine. Whatever she needs to do to be quiet, (laughs) good enough. (laughs) Johnny, what you've discovered tonight, and you're not even convinced that these were there before. You see notes in the margin of this book, and it's a combination of drawings and English phrases. You've worked out what spells these are associated to, you think, but you're not entirely sure what to make of the notes yet. Chuck, roll a d6 for Johnny to see how many of these spells are resonating with him. Two. So you think you've worked out two of these spells, Johnny. Not how to perform them necessarily, but what needs to be done? What needs to be sacrificed to see them, to understand them better. You've zeroed in now on two incantations and two sections of this book. Maybe these are low-level spells, or just happen to be ones that were notated. Pyrotechnics, or mage hand. Yeah, exactly. Through your cross-referencing within this book, Johnny... You believe that one of these spells involves a knife and some kind of enchantment, some special power. You haven't worked out the specifics, but you believe that learning this spell would involve making a personal sacrifice with a knife, or maybe it's a particular knife. That part's unclear. Uh And the other spell, possibly more direct... Johnny thinks he needs the blood of an innocent. Although the meaning of innocent and what you do with that blood is murky. This spell seems different. It doesn't seem like an enchantment to you. You think it has something to do with aging based on the pictures. Hmm. Now, Chuck, give me a sanity check for Johnny after digging through this tome for a few more hours. Sure. Uh, That's a 79. That's a fail. On the fail, this isn't massive, but give me a d4. One. Okay, you'll lose just one point of sanity. But on the revelation that you might actually be able to learn a spell, or maybe two, is there any reaction? Uh, We're going to actually say that Johnny is a little excited. Sure, that's natural. Well, you know, just a little jazzed about this. Feel like we made some progress. And just as you close the book, you hear a knock at the door. Well, I think probably we'll put a pin in that while I go answer the door. (laughs) Okay. 
I do, I do like to think that Johnny answers the door with his grandma's butter knife out and a quizzical look in his eye. <laughs> I have a lot of knives. <laughs> now let's cut over to Ellie's room. What's Ellie been up to? I think I'll just go to sleep if I didn't hear anything. We'll start looking for Brock in the morning. Ellie, you're lying in this luxurious bed beneath a canopy in the suite as your mind begins to fade. You could swear you hear a voice whisper to you. Dream, Ellie. As you open your eyes, you find yourself sitting behind a small writing desk and the chair is creaking It almost seems to be in response to the sound of branches, which are slapping against the side of this cabin that you find yourself in. After a moment, you realize that this is the same cabin you visited on your way out of Canateo the day you hanged Maxwell Posey. You're sure of this, Ellie. The cabin isn't dilapidated the way your party found it last week, It's in decent shape. There is a man standing beside the fireplace, and he looks concerned. Maybe worried is more accurate. He's pacing and murmuring to himself, almost twitching with anxiety. You know that this is Dr. Henry, the same man who spoke to you in your last dream, but you were in a professor's office then. This is the type of dream, Ellie, a lucid dream, where you're trying to tell yourself to remember these things when you wake up. The man breaks from his muttering and begins speaking to you. Kate, Kate, what have you done? I can't do this. I can't stay. I want to help you, Kate. You you have to understand. I, I can't. And when you look down at the desk, you realize that You're writing in Kate's journal, the one that you found in this very desk. Yeah, I remember, in the secret compartment. Yes, and you are holding a pen to the paper, and it looks like you've just written. He is done. He is coming. You're picking up strongly now from the doctor that... He's disappointed in you, in Kate. He's shaking his head at you sadly. (laughs) That's not unfamiliar. I've been through this before. You do pick up this glint in his eye, and you're sure now, Ellie, that this is the same man you encountered in this cabin on this journey. This is Sparky, but he looks younger and much more put together. Kate, I need you to know I'd never hurt you. I didn't want this. I I thought there was something different out here for us. This is beyond me now, Kate. It's beyond both of us. And he turns and walks out the front door. Goodbye, Kate. Maybe you were right. And he disappears into the dark of night. I'll close the journal and lock it away. Okay. You start to put the journal away into that secret compartment, and black mist descends on the cabin. It's seeping in through cracks between the wood, filling the cabin. The candles are snuffed out all at once. And as you sit in darkness in silence, slipping into this void. Suddenly you hear glass shattering all around you. An oozing tentacle curls around your neck and squeezes your throat, Ellie. It feels like your eyeballs are going to burst from their sockets. When you feel a sudden release... And now you stand on a bridge, suspended by chains in this void of space. There's a corpse laid out before you. It's Maxwell Posey, the man you hanged in Canateo. 
Give me a power roll for Ellie. Oh no, 98. You're gripping a knife and you look down at your hands and you feel like Ellie now and not Kate. This knife, it's interesting, it has a curved blade. And on the failed power roll, you're compelled to do this, Ellie. You bury that knife into the sternum of this corpse, and Maxwell Posey begins to split and shrivel, and black mist escapes his body to join the void. You reach inside, you can't help it, to feel what your eyes are telling you. And the body is empty. There's nothing. And as you continue down this bridge, Ellie, there are more bodies, and they're lined up head to heel. You see Lance, Father Flint, Jeremiah, and Johnny. One by one, Ellie, you do the same thing with your knife, and you open their bodies, slicing towards you. But instead of that yawning pit you found inside of Posey, their guts spill out onto this bridge. And the smell of decay is overwhelming. That's pretty fucked up, Ellie. What the hell are you doing? It's a nightmare. You're fine. That's a relief. A voice behind you begins to rumble forward until... It settles behind your right ear in a whisper. You're too late. They're already gone. But do not fear, Ellie. Shall live the progeny. And Ellie, you're standing here, compelled to look down at your own flesh with that knife. What would you like to do? No, I'll just do it. Let's find out. Wonderful. You force the knife into your own torso, and a beautiful black mist flows from your body. You wake up in your bed at the Fulton Place Hotel, and you're sure, Ellie, that you saw a final wisp of that mist dissolve right here in the hotel room. Give me a sanity check, Alex. Yeah, I think I need to. How much of those sanity you got left? I have 36. That's a good number. 36 is a good number. I rolled a 31. Great. You passed the sanity check, but I am going to take one point of sanity from Ellie just a normal dream (laughs) that's fine cutting open some bodies no big deal Mondays am I right (laughs) you're getting used to the nightmares is there anything you'd like to do I'll want to look at the journal oh nice Ellie walks over to the desk and opens Kate's journal is there anything you're looking for in particular Just flip through it. Sure. As you begin to turn the pages, you're noticing that this looks much different than the last time you read it, Ellie. In deep black ink, there are scribbles and scratched out words and gibberish notations all over this journal. You look down at the desk and realize there's ink all over this desk. And all over your hands. And as you continue flipping through all the way to the end of the book, Ellie, you notice the last page is altered too. And of course, this is your handwriting. It is done. He will be reborn. You are listening to Ain't Slayed Nobody. For ad-free episodes, heaps of bonus content, and special programming, please join our Patreon posse at patreon.com slash ain't slayed. 
or subscribe to Ain't Slayed Nobody Plus at Apple Podcasts. See the show notes for full credits and help us grow by posting friendly reviews and spreading the word to your friends and followers. Thank you and good luck out there.